be with you a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew Jesus said to his disciples do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets I have come not to abolish but to fulfill amen I say to you until heaven and earth pass away not the smallest letter or the smallest part of a letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches these commandments will be called greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to your ancestors, you shall not kill, and whoever kills will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with brother will be liable to judgment, and whoever says to his brother, Rika, will be answerable to the Sanhedrin, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to fiery Gehenna. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there recall that your brother has anything against you. Leave your gift there at the altar. Go first and be reconciled with your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Settle with your opponent quickly while you're on the way to court. Otherwise, your opponent will hand you over to the judge, and the judge will hand you over to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Amen, I say to you, you will not be released until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into Gehenna. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into Gehenna. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a bill of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, unless the marriage is unlawful, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to your ancestors, do not take a false oath, but make good to the Lord all that you vow. But I say to you, do not swear at all, not by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make a single hair white or black. Let your yes mean yes, and your no mean no. Anything more is from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. I remember watching my daughter when she used to play soccer. I think she was about six years old when she first started, and when I watched a game with teams made up of girls at that age, it seemed like all of them would just crowd around the ball and kick it. I don't think they really cared about what direction they kicked it. 
or even where the ball went. They just needed to get their feet on it. And when players are so young, the coach pretty much shows the girls what the field looks like, what the nets are for, the pretty shapes and colors on the ball, how to kick the ball, what kind of shoes, shorts, socks, and jerseys to wear. But as a dad, to watch the game, it was pretty much just a mob of girls giggling and having fun as they moved in a mass of feet and ponytails up and down the field. As the girls on the team grew a little older, I could notice that they weren't just swarming around the ball in the big mob anymore, but they were spread across the field, each in their position. And while some of them seemed to focus more on the pretty yellow flowers in the field or on a bug, for the most part, the girls were noticeably better. Coaches had taught and the girls had learned more about playing the game. They moved up a level. As they grew even older, the girls learned how to work together as a team, passing the ball to one another, playing defense, and scoring goals. The girls listened to and understood what the coaches showed them. They practiced techniques and strategies, and they played much better. They moved up another level. Now let's jump to professional athletes who perform at the highest level. I remember hearing a talk given by a deacon some time ago, and in it he explained that these athletes have reached and can play at this level because even with all of their experience, they are still willing and able to accept constant coaching. They and their coaches are still working to be even better. And if we think about it, this is kind of what Jesus is doing for us today. He's kind of like the coach, bringing us up to the next level. Now like the disciples in the gospel story, we know the commandments and laws, thou shall not kill, thou shall not commit adultery, thou shall not lie, and so on. And most of us can probably meet those expectations. But Jesus raises the bar a notch. He wanted the righteousness of his disciples to surpass that of the Pharisees and scribes who also knew and kept the laws. And as his disciples today, he wants the same for us. He has a better way for us. He wants us to move up to the next level. And he does this by turning the laws inside out. Jesus asks us to not just focus on our external actions in keeping the letter of the law, but to turn our attention inward on ourselves and reflect on something that touches us much more deeply, the intentions of our hearts. Now this might make some of us a little bit uncomfortable. Truthfully, it's easy for us and even for others to see our outward observance of the laws and know that we are not murderers, adulterers, or liars. And if this is all we're concerned about, we might consider ourselves good and righteous people, just like the Pharisees and scribes did. But when we move to the next level, when we do as Jesus asks and focus on the intentions of our hearts and think not about how we didn't kill, but about how many times at home or at work or in school, we've become angry with someone and then talked about them or called them names, especially if we did it behind their backs. We may not think of ourselves as so good. When we move to the next level and think about how we have not committed adultery, but of a time we might have been out with our friends and looked lustfully at a man or a woman, made or agreed with comments somebody else made about them, or the time we spend gazing on them on the internet, we may not feel so righteous. When we move to the next level and think of when we might have told others who asked if we wanted to spend time doing something with them, that we were busy when we really weren't, just because we didn't want to hang out with them because of what others might think of us, or told someone who asked us for help at school or at work that we didn't know how to do something when we really did because we were just too lazy 
to make the effort to help. Whenever our yes doesn't mean yes, or our no mean no, we may not feel so honest. When we try to hide these and all of our other secret sins within us, things we think only we know about ourselves, things we think we can hide even from God, we find ourselves feeling miserable, burdened, and empty. And if we buy into what the devil and the world would have us believe, we're failures. We let God down. We just can't be good. Who could ever love us? We don't like who we see when we look at ourselves. And this is what hurts. But think about this. How fitting is it that Jesus asks us to look into our hearts right after Valentine's Day, a day celebrated with hearts everywhere, not to make us feel bad or condemn us, but to bring us to the next level, to make us better. And I, I imagine if we were to receive a Valentine's Day card from Jesus, the one who loves us more than anyone else, it might go something like this. Dear child of mine, you don't have to fall into that evil trap of thinking that you are worthless or unlovable. You and your sin are the reason I came to earth. You and your sin are the reason I suffered and died on that cross. You and your sin are the reason I rose from the dead. I heard you at the start of Mass today as you reflected on the intentions of your heart and admitted that you have those things there you don't like, those places you need me to heal. Love overflowed from my heart when I heard your humble plea for my mercy and forgiveness. You see, I know all that stuff you carry inside you, even the secret things you think you can hide, but you are still mine. I claim you as my own. I still call you my friend. I still love you. I love you so much that I can't just leave you where you're at, but want desperately for you to be with me, starting now, and to stay with me forever. So know that I am here for you, right now, to help and strengthen you, to work with you on those things you need to change in your heart, to remove sin and everything else that doesn't belong there, and to build up your heart in love so you can look and act more like me. Fix your gaze on me as you come forward to receive me in the Eucharist, and know that my loving eyes are on you. When you feel me in your hand, I can feel you. When you take me into your body, I become part of you. Oh, how I love you. And want nothing more than for you to surrender, to stop trying to control everything in your life, to stop worrying, and right here, right now, just run to me, fall into my arms, and feel my merciful embrace. And then, as you go back to your everyday life, take the love and mercy that we have together and share it with everyone you meet. Jesus, Jesus.